brethren, we have met to worship. from Jeremiah this week because it's the only book we read during this week so <laughs> and um, it's just pretty much all the same isn't it they, the reason they call what the wailing prophet is that what they weeping prophet weeping prophet, weeping yeah. prophet. And I, you can see why because boy time and time and time and time again God tells them what to do and the people say nope we're not going to do that it's like wow <laughs> so I was trying to find something encouraging <laughs> um, and so um, I've picked two parts. Um, one is um, Jeremiah 16, verse 17, and then I'm going to read 17, um, 5 through 8. <clears throat> For my eyes are on their, on their ways. On, I'm sorry, let me start that again. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. And, of course, that's God obviously speaking. Then in verse, uh, chapter 17, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Well, we're here in uh, Jeremiah chapter 24, and as I said, we're going to read all ten verses. So why don't we do that, and then I'll make my intro introduction to this passage. The Lord showed me and I behold and the Lord showed me and behold two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon had carried away captive Jeconiah the son of Jehoiakim king of Judah the princes of Judah with the carpenters and the smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs even like the figs that are first ripe and the other basket had very naughty figs 
which could not be eaten, they were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil figs, very evil. They cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will send my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil, surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt, I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them until they be consumed from off the land that I give, that I gave unto them and to their fathers." Okay, there's our reading today. In the last two weeks, um, we've talked about principles of Bible interpretation. And it's been really easy because in Isaiah chapter 42, the bruised reed and the smoking flax, that was you know, picked up in the New Testament where Matthew says about the ministry of Jesus that that compares to the servant there in Isaiah 42. So we talked about that principle of Bible interpretation where the, when the Bible speaks of itself whether Old Testament or New, that is the highest form of biblical criticism and biblical interpretation. Now, last week we were in Isaiah chapter 61, and Jesus takes up Isaiah 61 and reads it, verses 1 and 2, in the synagogue of Nazareth. And he puts the book away, well, he actually gives it to the minister, and the minister puts it away, and then he says, this scripture, this day is fulfilled in your hearing. So another principle of biblical interpretation is when the Savior speaks about a passage or a prophet or someone in the past, he picks that up and he talks about it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the discussion when it comes to that passage of Scripture. People talk all the time about how Jonah you know, could not be in the belly of the fish you know, for three days and three nights. Well, Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, when he says that, that ends the discussion about whether or not Jonah was ever in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. He was, because the Savior talks about that. Okay, that, So that's another principle of biblical interpretation. Today, we come to a third. So we're going to talk today about uh, this, this last, or this next, actually, principle of biblical interpretation. So we're going to look at today how to employ the imagery of the Old and the New Testament to point us in the right direction when we're reading the Scripture. And we are going to understand that today. Not all Scripture is written to us, but it is all written for us. Okay, so it's not written to us. Jeremiah was not writing to us. He was writing to the Jews in his day. But when we read that, we understand that it's wonderful that God is writing a letter for us on the heels of or on the back of a letter written to somebody else. So we're going we're gonna to understand that today as we go forward. Let me read to you what Matthew Henry had to say about this, which I just dearly love. He said, This short chapter helps us to put a very comfortable construction upon a great many long ones by showing us that the same providence, which to some is a savor of death unto death, that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, may by the grace and blessing of God be made to others a savor of life unto life. And that though God's people share with others in the same calamity, yet it is not the same to them that it is to others, 
but is designed for their good and shall issue in their good. To them it is a correction rod in the hand of a tender father, while to others it is an avenging sword in the hand of a righteous judge. It's Matthew Henry from his commentary on Jeremiah chapter 24. I love that because he's right. We see today a picture of two baskets of figs. And for one group, they are bright and fresh, and the other group, they are rotten and smelly. And so we understand that as he takes Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he says it's just like what Paul said, the preaching of the gospel to some is life unto life, but the preaching of the gospel to others is death unto death. There's no grace in it because they twist it and they don't listen to it. And we're going to see some of that here in, uh, in our meditation today in Jeremiah. So go back with me now to Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 1. And listen to what is said here. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. Now to understand this, we have to remember uh, the command to tithe the first fruits found in Deuteronomy chapter 26. Here's that principle of allowing the imagery that's used in the scripture in other places to help us understand what we're reading today. So you come to Jeremiah chapter 24 and you look, baskets of figs. I don't understand baskets of figs. Why would baskets of figs be in this chapter? Well, in Deuteronomy, we're told that the people are instructed by Moses via the Lord Thou shalt take of the first fruit of all the fruit of the earth, which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall put it in a basket. Well, there's our basket. And shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. Now, the placement of the baskets before the temple in Jeremiah's image then is not strange, because we understand that the gift of the first fruits is taken in a basket to the place of worship. And so what we have in Jeremiah's image are two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. This temple of the Lord in Jeremiah's image then is not a throwaway image. These baskets are the tools of worship. They have been brought by the worshiper with the tithe of first fruit. Now, these contain something that's given to the Lord in obedience to the Mosaic law. And the temple in Jeremiah's vision sets the baskets of fruit in the light of Deuteronomy chapter 26. So we know what the baskets are for. We know what the first fruits are for. We just have baskets filled with first ripe figs, at least in one, and in the other, rotten figs. Who would come to worship with rotten figs? Well, notice the figs. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. The figs here, the fruit, represents the works that are presented to God. And a more spiritualized uh, idea here is that these figs represent something presented to God, the works presented to God. And Jesus helps us here because here with the identification of the figs, we have both in Matthew chapter 21 and in Mark chapter 11. You remember that Jesus, when he leaves Jerusalem, he finds a fig tree. And he walks up to that fig tree thinking that he's going to find fruit on the fig tree, but he doesn't, just leaves. And he curses the fig tree. And both Matthew and in, um, is that me? Oh, sorry. So in both Matthew and in Mark, Jesus finds the fig tree, doesn't find fruit on it. This is you know, he's illustrating what he finds in Israel. There's no fruit. There's no works. There's no repentance. And so he curses the fig tree and it withers and dies. Now, he demonstrates this in a parable that he tells in Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 13, we have this. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, until I dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, after that, thou shalt cut it down. So Jesus tells this parable of the, of the landowner 
and the fig tree illustrating his ministry and the lack of good works that he has found in Israel. Notice in the, in the parable he says, I've come to this tree now three years seeking fruit. The ministry of Jesus was how long? Three years. So the, the fruit that Jesus was looking for was repentance and good works, and they hadn't produced it at all. So when we come back now to Jeremiah, what are we looking at when we look at the figs? We're looking at what has been presented to the Lord as fruit of the life of these people in Israel. Now, you notice there in, um, we're going to look at the background, because you'll notice there in verse 1 that we mention Nebuchadnezzar. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away the captive Jeconiah, the son of Joachim, king of Judah. And the princes of Judah were the carpenters and the smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. So when you're reading a passage like this, you need to understand the background. And the background of this can be found in both 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and 2 Kings chapter 24. Both of those record these happenings with Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he takes out the king, Jehoiachin, and he takes him off to Babylon. And then he puts in place a man named Zedekiah. He is now... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's puppet king in Jerusalem. But he's, Zedekiah is a Jew. And once Nebuchadnezzar leaves, what does he do? He rebels. It makes Nebuchadnezzar mad, of course, and then he's going to come back and destroy everything. So you look at 2 Chronicles. Let me just read a portion here. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. And now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and his abominations, which he did, and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of kings of Israel and Judah. And, Jeho and Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his stead." Then in 2 Kings, we also hear the same story, but from a different perspective. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiachin, king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon. He and his mother and his servants and the princes and his officers and the king of Babylon took them in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house, cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as Solomon had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem, all the princes and the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives, all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained, save the poor sort of people of the land. He carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon, and the king's mother, the king's wives, his officers, the mighty men of the land, he carried away into Babylon from Jerusalem. And all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, a 1,000, all that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. So this is the background that uh, Jeremiah is talking about. This has happened. Zedekiah is now king, and that's when we have Z or Jeremiah seeing this vision of the two baskets. So let's look at the vision now. Verse 2. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. I love that word, naughty. In the Hebrew, the word here is evil. So every time he mentions the, the bad figs, he always uses the word for evil. And I don't know why the King James translates it here, naughty, but I certainly am glad they did because I love that. These naughty, they're very naughty, which could not be eaten. They were so very naughty. They're so bad. So, verse 3, The Lord said unto me, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil. They cannot be eaten. They are so evil. You know, this is something that we often see in the Scripture when a prophet sees a vision, just like in Amos when he sees the vision of the... Um, of the ephods. He sees the vision and the Lord says, what do you see? And he repeats what he sees. 
because the Lord wants to emphasize what it is that's being seen in the vision. Here the Lord is emphasizing, I think, to Jeremiah's heart and also to ours that we're seeing the same thing. It's repeated twice. So the emphasis is there. And then Jeremiah describes these. Well, he says the figs are very good. The first bunch is very good, he says. So we have the very good figs there in, uh, in verse 3. And in verse 4, he says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, like these good figs. So now we're going to find out what the figs are all about. He says, like these good figs, so, uh, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Do you see that there? Did you, did you notice that? He says, I have carried them out of the land, or I have carried them out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans. How does that end? Yeah. No, we don't want to read that, do we? We don't want to read that. Discipline never seems pleasant at the time. But as uh, the writer to the Hebrews said, it always produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness in us. And he says to these people, my carrying you out is for your good. How wonderful that is. It never seems good at the time when it is delivered, but it always produces something wonderful. As the Hebrew writer tells us there in chapter 12. He, you notice also that he says, I will set my eyes upon them for good. Notice that for good is repeated again. It's twice here. Once it's for their good, then it is the Lord saying, I will do this, I will do this for them for good. So the people carried off. And you can just imagine. I mean, I don't know that we can imagine, but think about a 600-mile-plus journey by foot. And you're the slave probably chained to the person in front of you and behind you, and you're walking 600 miles to go to a place you've never been before, up into the northern part of that area of Palestine and then down, uh, down through the Euphrates River Valley all the way down into Mesopotamia. That's a long journey, a long journey. And the Lord said, it's for their good. I'm doing this for them for good. Yeah. And also, just, just as you read through here with me, notice all the I will or will I statements. So will I acknowledge them? He says there in verse 4. And then here in verse 6, I will set my eyes upon them for good. Notice there in verse 2, I will bring them again to this land. I'm sorry, verse 6, still in verse 6. I will set my eyes upon them. I will bring them again to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Sounds to me like the Lord has a plan for his people, even though his people are going through a really tough patch right now. Does he have a plan for his people today? Does he have a plan for his people today that are going through a rough patch? Oh, I think he does. And all of this is still true. His eye is still on us. His design is still for us. He is still intending to bring us and to build us and to plant us, even though right now we don't see any building, planting, or setting. None of that is happening. But he says, I will. And you know his promise is just as good as what he says. The Lord speaks through the prophet later in this prophecy. In Jeremiah 29, he writes a letter to those who had gone off into captivity. And in the letter, he says, verse 10 and 11 there, of Jeremiah 29, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The Lord has a plan. He actually gives through Jeremiah, he, he sets the clock on the plan. He says 70 years. Click. You ever do that on your stove at home? I don't know. We used to have a stove at the house. I don't know what house it was that we had that stove. But we had a stove. And when you'd set the timer, it would go click, 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 click. You know, it would click all the way around. And you'd set it. And then as soon as you let it go, you hear that spark. The tension on that spring grab, and then we start ticking, tick, 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 tick. Well, that's what the Lord just did here in that letter. 
70 years, he turns that timer, click, 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 all the way over, and then he lets it go. 70 years now, we're counting down. And guess what happened? 70 years later, who's coming back into the land? Those people are coming back in the land. Why? Because the Lord said, I will visit you, he said. I will perform all that I have planned for you. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. We, we, we in our arrogance think we know the thoughts that God thinks towards us, and usually you know what it is? It's usually bad stuff. We usually think he's disappointed with us. We usually think he's put us aside. We usually think he can't use us because we think about all the bad stuff or the wrong stuff that we've done. Christian, I'm speaking to you. We think that that's what the Lord thinks, but we don't know what he thinks because what he thinks is that we're beautiful and that we're spotless and that he's going to use us. That's what he thinks of us, and he's going to. You just might be in a rough place right now, but he's put you there for your good so that he can use you. And he wants to use you because he thinks you're the most wonderful thing in the world because you have believed in Jesus. I will bring them again. I will build them. I will plant them. Notice verse 7. I will give them a heart to know me. I am the Lord that they shall be my people. I will be their God. So really, this is not about a captivity in Babylon, but a captivity of heart. The heart was the problem and is what got them kicked out of the land. But guess what? The Lord's going to do a work because he says, I'm going to give them a heart to know me. And that happens because of the discipline. That's why it's good for them. They shall be my people, and I will be their God, because that's where he wants them to be. That's where he wants us to be, for him to be our God, and not all the other junk that we're tempted to make gods in this life. They shall return to me with their whole heart. Notice that he didn't invite them to return to him. He said, it's going to happen. I'm going to work in them, and I'm going to bring them back. They shall return to me with their whole heart. It's one thing to come back into the land and not have a heart wholly devoted to the Lord, but it's a whole other thing to be in a land of foreign rulers and have a heart wholly devoted to the Lord. So where are you really at home? You're really at home in the place, wherever that place might be, where your heart is wholly devoted to the Lord. That's where you're at home at. Because you can carry that home, homeland with you anywhere. It doesn't matter where you're sent. And that's what the Lord wants for his people. He wants them to be, he wants them to have a heart wholly devoted to him. Jeremiah 22, or 29 again, verses 12 and 13. Then shall you call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. There it is, wholeheartedness again in prayer. Seeking God with our whole heart. Not just religious activity, praying just because it's time to pray on a Sunday morning or praying just because it's time to pray when you sit down over your meal. That's not wholehearted prayer. Wholehearted prayer is when you seek him because you want to find him. When you seek him because you need him, when you're poor and you're desperate and you're despised and you're in that rough patch, that's when you seek the Lord. And that wholehearted seeking, ladies and gentlemen, that's not religious fluff. That is true religion of heart. When you seek him in those places. Oh, he says, you know what? Those people, when they call on me, I'm going to answer. I'll hearken. You'll seek me. You'll find me. Oh, you know what? That sounds a whole lot like what Jesus said, doesn't it? In Matthew chapter 6. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful how we have the Savior's words which line up so finely here with Jeremiah chapter 29? And then we have the, the naughty figs. Verse 8. The Lord says, as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely, thus saith the Lord. So will I give. Notice now we have the I will and will I statements again here in the passage. So will I give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. Now, you notice that you don't have... Uh, you don't have an infinitive here. You don't have a, uh, one of the prepositional statements that begins with two. 
Always, I'm looking for that as I'm reading this, right? I will give, and then he makes a list of all the things, Zedekiah and, and the people and the princes and the residue and all them that dwell, in the, and even those in Egypt, to something. But he doesn't. He just says, I'm going to give them. When the Lord makes an open-ended statement like that, it should make us tremble. Because we don't know where it's going. And this word give, the Hebrew word to give is repeated three times in this section with the naughty figs. Three times, going to give. Sometimes that Hebrew word can be translated, I'm going to bring. One of the passage, yeah, it's in verse 9. And King James has, I will deliver. That's the Hebrew to give. So bring, give, deliver, those are all good translations of this word. The Lord is going to do something here. He's not, uh, he's not going to give them something good. He, it's not like he's going to give them a heart to know him. There's no giving of that here. No, he's giving them away. This answers the why question for us. Jeremiah chapter 29, again, this letter to the, uh, the residents in Babylon, we have this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword, with the famine, with the pestilence. And I will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations whither I have driven them. Because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord." which I sent to them by my servant, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but they would not hear, saith the Lord. You see, that's the problem. This is why we have these bad figs. They're evil, very evil. Why? Because they have not listened to the word of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, where would you have been if 10,000 people from your city had been suddenly deported and taken by a foreign king? If you had seen that, would you have gone back to worshiping your idols? Would you have gone back to trying to get into Egypt? Would you have looked for help from some other source? Or would you have hit your knees and said, Dear God, help us? That's what these people did not do. Zedekiah was set on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar and he could not lift a voice of prayer to God. That's wrong, friends. That is naughty figs, very evil. They're looking somewhere else, all the time somewhere else. Grace does a good work in the people that are carried off, but here in Jerusalem, it's a hurtful work. It's a hurtful work. Notice verse 9, and I will deliver them to be removed. This is uh, Jeremiah 24, 9. I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. You see, the other group said for their good. But this group, because they saw the judgment of God and didn't do a thing about it, God says it's for now your hurt. Verse 5, it says it's for their good, but here we have for their hurt. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of build them, set them, plant them. It's the opposite of giving them a, a whole heart to seek me. It's the opposite of all that. These people, in, a, in, a, in one sense, let me just, and just indulge me here. In one sense, these people had more grace than the ones that were carried off. Because they weren't carried off. They didn't have to march that 600 plus mile trip into Babylon. They didn't have to be chained up. And carried along just like slaves. They, they didn't experience that. So in one sense, they experienced more grace than the ones who went off into Babylon. Because they saw the captivity of the brethren. But instead of understanding the hand of the Lord in that event, they doubled down on their sin. And some even ran off to Egypt thinking that the king of Egypt could protect them. So what do you do with naughty figs? Verse 10. I will send the sword. Again, notice the I will statement. God's going to do a work. I will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence among them. Do you notice that every time he talks about the judgment that's coming, it's always the same three? These three writers 
are the ones that come, the sword, famine, pestilence. And it's always the, it's always the definite article, the sword, the famine, the pestilence. The riders are at the gates, and all they're waiting for is the Lord to say, go. They're coming. Jerusalem, be careful. I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Here's our verb gave again there in uh, verse 10. So what do you do with naughty figs? Well, you throw them out. Theo Lash in his commentary on Jeremiah says, he will prog progressively render them more like these figs, that is, these evil figs, gradually harden them in their enmity against the Lord. On the path that they've chosen and will not give up, he will lead them deeper and deeper into sin and depravity. This is the curse of sin. Theo Lach. So how do we apply this? Well, number one, in reading, studying, and interpreting the Bible, we always look to the Scripture for its own rendering of the passage, the images, the language. We look to Christ to see if he gives us the final word on the matter. That's number one. Number two, when we apply this, we would remember that all Scripture is not written to us, but is written for us. Jeremiah was writing for the people of his day, but as we read about the figs, we're able to understand Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. And we remember what he said to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God for it's profitable, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Thirdly, as we apply this, we must remember that it is written for us because we have a responsibility to look carefully at the perfect law of liberty and observe what manner of people we are. And in this case, we're like the people who went off into captivity with a promise and a humbled heart, who were ready to call on their God, maybe for the first time in many years. Maybe for the first time in many years. Or... Are we like Zedekiah's crew who ignored the lesson of captivity and instead of repentance doubled down on their sins, idolatries, and rebellions to God? Well, we'll have to judge. Hopefully the Spirit of God will speak to us about which we are. But let us not be deceived. Rebellion, idolatry, and pride and arrogancy stink to the Heavenly Father just like the naughty figs. So just as we read about these naughty figs and how they represent the people who stayed in Jerusalem and how they rebelled and sinned, ladies and gentlemen, our works, if they are not righteous, our works, if they are corrupt, stink to the high heavens. Just remember, all secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. Nobody gets away. Let us not be deceived. And then the lastly, I would say this. And this is the good, I always want to end with the good stuff. Humility and drawing near to the Father are always, every time, every day, every minute, every moment, acceptable to him. Just like the tithe of first ripe fruits brought in the basket, set at the temple door so that the priests could distribute them as they saw fit, just as that offering is acceptable to the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, your humility, your heartfelt seeking for the Lord, your poorness of spirit, your meekness of mind, ladies and gentlemen, it's always acceptable to him. Judge what's going on around you and what the Lord might be saying to you and seek him with all your heart. Father, help us today as we consider these matters that we find here in Jeremiah and open our hearts and our minds to them. Father, that we might be faithful uh, children of yours, that we might do according to your word, Father, just as you instruct us there in Proverbs to listen to the Father's instruction. Father, help us to listen to the Father's instruction and wear it like a gold chain around our necks and a crown upon our heads. Oh, Father, that we might um, walk in your ways 
that we might keep them diligently with all our hearts. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.